It is, again, a great pleasure to welcome you to this service of worship as a newly commissioned Stephen minister. We especially welcome those among you who may be visiting. We're glad you're here. We invite you all to take the registration pads that you find on the inside aisle, sign them, pass them down, see who you're worshiping with today, and let us know that you were here. There's a lot going on, as always, at Huntsville First, and I hope you'll take a few minutes to take a look at the at Huntsville First. I want to bring to your attention a couple of things that are not in the bullet in the at Huntsville First today. First of all, this Thursday, um, like every Thursday during Lent, there is a, a, an AGO Lenten recital series. This is the Organist Guild. And this Thursday in particular, our own Jillian Garner will be performing at noon here on Thursday. So you're invited to come to the sanctuary for that Lenten recital. Also, great congratulations are in order for our own Brittany Camp. Brittany has passed a major milestone in her, in her response to God's call on her life into the ministry. As a result of what happened this week, she will be commissioned as a provisional elder in the United Methodist Church in May. We're very proud of her stepping forward in faith, and I encourage you when you see her to congratulate her on taking this step into the ordained ministry. We're so proud of her. As we turn now to a time of corporate prayer, I remind you that we are, in fact, a Stephen Ministry congregation, and there will always be a Stephen Minister and myself available to pray with you at the end of any worship service, including this one. We have a number of prayer requests of members and friends who are in need of prayer. I want to lift up just two in particular here, Carol Chase and Fred McLaurin, both of whom are in Huntsville Hospital. But with some good news here, I'd like to share with you the rosebud that we have on the altar. This is in honor, honor of the birth of Nora Claire Coppins, who was born back in January to Zach and Katie Coppins. So congratulations to them and this new life in our midst. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Lord, gracious God, Heavenly Father, we saw something in the heavens this morning that we haven't seen in a while, the sun. And it seemed to have come a little later than we're used to. As we, your people, have adjusted our clocks to follow the sun as we move from a time of darkness, we are reminded, in fact, through this past week, that we have been in darkness. The people in darkness have needed a great light. And through this darkness, we have made the best of things. We have taken things into our own hands. And for the most part, we have lived as if we've got it covered. Until we're reminded of mornings like this, by the interruption of our clocks, That things aren't always in our control. Lord, we confess too often we take things into our own hands instead of yielding to you first. Hear now, Lord, our silent confessions of how we need you more than we are acting right now. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer of confession and give us confidence as you gave us through your son, through that most famous of verses, that you loved us so much so that you sent your son so that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life because you did not send your son to condemn us but to save us. Lord, reset the clocks of our hearts like we've reset the clocks in our houses so that not only may we follow the Son, we more, may more carefully follow your Son. 
your son, who taught us to pray by saying, Our Our Father, Father, who who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy Thy kingdom kingdom come, thy thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Would you please remain standing for the scripture reading? It's found in John 3, 1 through 17. And if you would like to follow along in your pew Bible, it's on page 89. It's uh, Nicodemus' visit with Jesus. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born again after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I say to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about earthly things, heavenly things? No one has ascended in heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the son of man. And just as most of Moses lifted up, lifted up the serpent into the wilderness, so must the son of man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thanks be to God. This morning, about 7.15, I arrived here at the church, and wheeling in in her little yellow car right behind me was our organist, Julian. We were standing there about to come into the church in the back entrance, And suddenly here were the men that come around and they clean up after the bars on Saturday night. You may not realize that, but there are people who come and do that every Sunday morning for us. One of the men walked up to me and I was feeling my age this morning. Uh, I don't know that it was not getting that hour of sleep, but over the last two days, we've been moving our daughter to another city where she has taken a job. And... I thought I pretty much had a Ph.D. in moving since as a Methodist minister I've moved 14 times. But I'm older now. It's a little bit more difficult to move furniture in and out. And I was sore and stiff. And this man walked up to me and he looked at me and he said, Preacher, will you offer a prayer? And I thought, excuse me? And he said, will you pray? And I said, yes, is something going on? And he said, no, I'm just an old Catholic boy, and I won't get to go to church today because I'm working, and I just want to hear a prayer. (laughs) So in the parking lot, we joined hands and prayed this morning. Sometimes, even when we're old, things come to us like that. How many of you are old? (laughs) I'm going to keep them up. Don't put them down. How many of you are old? How many of you feel old? 
I'm looking to see if my acolyte's got her hand up. No, she's good. <laughs> Nicodemus is our story today. During this Lenten season, we're talking about people who had a time of sitting and talking with Jesus or Jesus went to them on his way to Jerusalem, making a difference in people's lives. The gospel writer John puts this story at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Not technically so, but he sits it there so that we can begin to see what he sees as so important to Jesus. The other gospel writers put this at the end of his life. Nicodemus was one of 6,000 Pharisees in the time of Jesus. It was a very controlled group number. They were called the separated ones, the religious elite. He was also one of 70 men who were called and set apart as a part of the Sanhedrin, the lawyers that with the consent of the Romans still rule the country. Nicodemus was a renowned teacher and attorney. He shared in so many things. People would come to him for his experience and his wisdom. And in so doing, he had amassed a great fortune. Yet this night that we're talking about is different for Nicodemus. An event had happened earlier in the day. Just earlier than this moment, Jesus comes into the temple area. And he clears the temple of the money changers. So the last thing that Nicodemus had seen of Jesus was Jesus walking out the southern end of the temple across that way with a whip in his hand. And Jesus has gone to someone's home, we know not who, to rest for the evening. And under the cover of darkness, this leader of the Jews makes a journey to visit with Jesus. There in the house, the humble builder from Galilee is waiting. Nicodemus says to Jesus, Rabbi, we know that you're a good teacher. We, notice he says that. Obviously the Sanhedrin's been talking about Jesus. We know that you're a teacher who's come from God, for no one could do what you do without the touch of God. And Jesus then flips it on him. Have you ever noticed how Jesus had a way of peeling back the layers in people's lives and getting right down to the core and he says to Nicodemus, very truly I tell you, no one will see the kingdom of God unless they're born from above. Now if Nicodemus was confused when he was heading there, he really is confused now. You see, Nicodemus has spent his entire life studying the scrolls of the law. Day after day, leaning over those ragged scrolls, searching every jot and tittle, making decisions about the law. And now Jesus is saying something that he's never heard about the kingdom of God. So Nicodemus asks him questions. It's almost like it's a courtroom setting. How can anyone be born again after having been born once and growing old? Can one enter a second time into his mother's womb and then be born? You see, Nicodemus was old, but he wasn't just physically old. He had grown spiritually old as well. With the continued Roman occupation, his hope for Israel had diminished. Serving on the Sanhedrin and hearing the squabbles of disputes over possessions and power, he had lost his love for people. And as his fortune grew, his compassion grew less for those who were in need. Legend has it that Nicodemus' wife had died just less than a year earlier. And so he was not only old physically, but he was old spiritually. He was beaten down and worn out. Everything seemed old in him. He was tired. He was used up. The joints of his spirit complained to him. And yet he came to Jesus because something was burning within him. Some sense of authority that Jesus had was burning within his own heart. Jesus tells him, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What's flesh is flesh and what's spirit is spirit. But then he adds this, and it's not 
qualifiable. You must be born from above, he says. It was direct and uncompromising. It was a challenge to this man, Nicodemus. And it probably is a challenge to us today. It forced Nicodemus to take a look at his own spirit, how he was paralyzed and numb from what life had done to him. And Jesus, in that wonderful way that Jesus did, put his hand right on the place where it was hurting the most and where Nicodemus would say that he was just used up and tired. Jesus says, you have to be born again, even though you're old. Born again. We don't use that word a lot anymore. Born from on high, sired from above. We have heard those in our lives. I heard, that, heard those words growing up. Our pastors talked about it. Didn't pay a whole lot of attention to it in the realm of the world until we heard a peanut farmer from Georgia in 1976 when a northern respondent, news respondent said, are you a Christian? And Jimmy Carter responded, I'm born again Christian. And suddenly everybody jumped on the bandwagon, either for or against. What does it mean to be born again? It's not something like just accepting that Jesus is Lord. It's not just saying that we'll follow Jesus. But it's saying that we're going to receive and have received a new life from Jesus. That we are different because our life is not our own, but it is given to us, born into us from someone else. Not just a fleshly birth, but a spiritual birth. And Nicodemus said to Jesus, now how can this be? And Jesus said, are you a teacher of Israel and yet you don't understand what I'm saying to you? I can almost see Nicodemus closing his eyes and trying to look at it and say, how do I start over? I've spent my whole life studying the law. I'm not a bad person. I spent my whole life doing what I thought I was supposed to do. Is there some place in this godly way of living that I have missed? And Jesus would say, you've missed the most important point. For the center of Israel's law, the center of the scriptures was found in the fact that God loved us enough to save us. Nicodemus had placed these texts in his heart for years. He didn't have to pull up a scripture and read. He could quote it. He knew it that well. And yet here it was. Jesus saying, what is most primary for you? What is the central point that everything else leans on? And in the midst of that, Jesus reminds him that the kingdom of God is hinged not on us, but on the love of God for us. No doubt Jesus prays, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, so that everyone who believes in him, in him may not perish, but have eternal life. That phrase caught Nicodemus off guard. For Nicodemus had thought all his life, that being saved, that having eternal life was found in what we do, what he would do. Understanding the law, keeping the law, all of those things would be the determining factors. And yet Jesus is saying, no, what determines your life in the midst of life is the love of God. The love of God that changes you. So Nicodemus who had grown old, slow in his ways of walking, slow in his ways of speaking, was a slow person to change. But I believe he left Jesus' house that night where Jesus was staying, and things were different. Absolutely the light of God had shone upon him. Now we don't know whether or not Nicodemus came to a total relationship with Jesus. It's not told to us in the Scripture. There are only three times in the Bible that Nicodemus is mentioned. This time, when Jesus comes to him after cleansing the temple. The time when Jesus is brought before the Sanhedrin. Remember, Nicodemus is one of those 70 rulers. 
And they were just going to condemn Jesus and he told them they couldn't. That they, he had to be heard. He had to have a trial before he could be heard. And the last time we hear of Nicodemus is when he and Joseph of Arimathea are placing Jesus' body in the tomb after Jesus had been killed. There's something about this story. There's something about this story that leaves it open-ended because for all of us, being born anew may come in a moment. See the Apostle Paul for an example. And sometimes being born again and anew is a lifelong process of turning and moving closer and closer into the will of God so that we see the kingdom of God happening all around us. And sometimes we've been born again, but God still works with us. Sometimes we feel tired and old and our bodies ache. And the person picking up the garbage walks up to us when we least expect it and says... Pray for me. So here we are. It's about control. Isn't that the way it is with God's will? It's always about control. Nicodemus had control of his painful, hurting, broken life that was empty until he gave himself over to being born anew. So I wonder for us, can we become new again? Can you become new again? Can I become new again? Can we be reborn even in this moment? Can we again feel the touch of God upon our hearts and lives so that we are not just old so-and-so, but we are a young old so-and-so? When people see us, they don't just see our age, but they see the youth, the young ways of God's kingdom. Think of it this way. How many of you have a computer at home? You have a computer? How many of you have something that you have a password on at that computer? How many of you forget your passwords? Remember, we're old. You've already admitted it. What happens when you forget? You can go in there and it will say, forgot your password? Click here. Then it will say, what is your email address? Or something like that. And I go, or what is your ID? Well, if I knew that, I might know my password. So eventually you wind up calling the company and our first words out of our mouths are, look, I'm old and I've forgotten. So maybe on a day when we reset clocks, maybe we need to hear again that this life in Jesus is all about being reset over and over and over again, like resetting passwords because when they ask you something, the first thing they're going to ask you is, when were you born? And then they will say, where were you born? Those are those questions that we forget we answered. I believe Jesus would say to every one of us again today, it's important when we were born again. And it's important that we know where we were born again. It's important that we understand that the kingdom of God is tied into God's great love for every one of us. A love that was so great and strong that it took Jesus to a cross. When were you born again? I don't know what happened to Nicodemus. I just get the feeling that because he was there and stood up for Jesus in the Sanhedrin, and I get the feeling that because he was there and carried Jesus' body to a tomb, that in his mind, in his mind he was thinking, God, once again, do what you did for me. You took something that was old and dead and you brought it to life in me. Do that again for your son Jesus. 
do that again. And maybe today is just a day for every one of us again, resetting our clocks to be reset in our spirits, to be renewed, to receive new life from on high that will affect how we love and how we treat each other, that will affect us. You must be born again. It's important. Let's pray together. Oh God, you know each and every one of us. You know where we are and where we are hurting and how we are old and beaten and broken in places. And you know where we walk in the darkness hoping to find something that will light our path. So we pray again, O oh God, send your Son Jesus to us. Remind us that we don't have to keep walking broken, hurting, wounded, in the darkness. Remind us that your promise of being born again is extended even in this moment. Oh God, send your Holy Spirit. Turn us from who we are to who you call us to be. Even now, help us that we might be born anew so that we can share with others who are walking in darkness and pain. For God so loved this world that he sent his Son. Help us to let him make a difference. And we pray in his name. Amen.